Hi all, welcome back to another episode of how to design my garden, where do I start? In this episode, we're going to look at a brand new house. This is a brand new house, um, it's approximately five years of age. It's an absolute dream to work with. Um, firstly, we have to do a massive shout out to my neighbours who have lent me their house and lent me their property as the model for this video. So thank you so much guys, it is much appreciated. We're going to talk through a few things that are on the site and how this video will differ from the other houses that we're going to look at in this series. So previously we have looked at the house under renovation. Uh, we are going to look at a house in an urban setting and we're going to look at this house which which will be uh, a new build in a rural location. And some of the features they have existing already, as I've mentioned, it is a blank canvas, but we're all going to take into consideration some of the things that these guys have here in place first, and then how that will link into the garden design process. So let's get started. So first of all, we're going to take into consideration the doorstep. So the doorstep's done in this lovely um, natural sort of buff stone uh, infill, and it has this really nice dark uh, granite trim surround. So we have the nice dark granite riser with the light infill, and that's fantastic. It really complements the property color. The property color itself is done in like a nice light render, and it's really good for you know visibility reasons. So if somebody was approaching the house in low light levels, um, say for example there's no exterior lights on, you can kind of just roughly see where the steps are if somebody's approaching the front door. So we're going to link that into the garden very shortly, but that's a really nice feature to pick up on first. And then beyond the doorstep, between the driveway and the lawn itself, is a triple row of the granite cobble. So these are roughly about 100-100 mil approximately. So just like a nice 300 mil strip here, that's a really good contrast to say between the driveway, um, which is done in tarmac, and then the lawn itself. Um, I sort of would class this as a demarcation, it's just a nice visual separation, and it defines the driveway from the lawn, and it's just that kind of transition period between the two zones. And then we're going to pick up on that shortly, because we're going to move the camera down here just to we take into consideration the pillars as well. So just to recap then, uh, those granite cobbles are running right from right around the property. Uh, they run right around and then they finish here at the pillar. These pillars are a generous kind of 600-600 square pillar approximately. They might, they might be just a fraction bigger than that. And the reason why we're picking up on the pillar size at this point is because this house is really well proportioned. So the symmetry is really strong in this property. The pillars are well proportioned to the property size. So this house, if you imagine, if it was like a cake, if you ran a knife right through the middle and it came right through the front door, because it sits so central in its location as well, you have really equal then sort of lawn sizes either side. Now, the lawn on this side, I've measured it and it's roughly 420 square metres. And on this side, it's roughly 290 square metres. So you're going to say, okay, well, there's 100 square metres of difference there. How, you know, that doesn't sound too equal. But visually to the eye, yes, okay one lawn is slightly smaller than the other but proportionally between how they sit with the house they sit very equally neither side looks bigger than the other you know at first glance until you actually start to measure and you know everything links really well together so that is going to link into our soft planting which we are going to pick up on very shortly so like I mentioned, these guys are my neighbours, they have very kindly let me their house to do this video and strangely enough, although this house is much newer than the property I live in myself, there's a lot of similarities location wise. Firstly, we're both on a bit of a height, so we you know, we both have a drop away. The house sits more proud than what it does from the roadside. Both houses have a driveway that actually runs through the middle of the garden, so it's like a separation tool which is separating up two sides of the garden. Obviously, because we live such close proximity together, we both share the same soil. We don't have clay, we do have good free draining soil here, but the soil isn't completely sandy either, so it has a bit of sort of structure to it, but at the same time, it is free draining enough. And also I feel from that, not just because we're neighbors, but because of the driveway being the central separation of the two property boundaries, we could actually have a similar planting put in place. So for example, the style of this house, as I mentioned, it's really, it's got good symmetry, it has good proportions, and therefore it would be such a sin to ruin that if the planting was wrong. So for example, an avenue tree in this house would look fantastic. Now at U Cottage, we have used uh, the common oak um, as an avenue tree. That is a fantastic avenue tree. This house is, obviously much newer and I would probably want to still put an avenue tree in here but more contemporary. So for example, I know I'm always talking about it but Betchla Jack Montei 
up this driveway would look fantastic. So you're going to have them real gloss white stems, very clean, really small leaf. So when it does drop its leaf in the autumn, it's not like a big clunky leaf. It's a really small refined leaf. So you're not really going to notice too much leaf litter. Um, it would look really sharp and it would complement the render of the house really well. Because as I said, the house is done in that lovely smooth skim. You've got that nice white of the tree. And then that would actually really link you back into the cobble because the cobble themselves are also quite light in colour. So it's a full continuation. We're linking the planting into this another avenue tree could also be hornbeam hornbeam would also look fantastic um, in this property and actually whilst we're talking about trees we're going to just pause there this is where a lot of people go wrong sometimes when people move into a new house and they just want to get going they go to a garden center and they're just bamboozled by the variety that's there and they'll buy like 10 or 15 trees and usually they might just buy two of each or just one of everything they see then they come home and they have no idea where to plant them and then they just start sticking trees really randomly they don't read the trees requirements they don't actually recognize if the tree matches the property or not they don't maybe recognize if the tree even suits their locations and that is where so many people get it wrong so what i would say is especially with a style of house like this um, continuity is everything and therefore I wouldn't just go out and scatter a pile of random trees in here I would I would stick to one I'd be really strict with myself I would do a lot of research probably the top three trees I would pick for here would be Bechla Giacomontii that would be my number one choice you've got those nice gloss white stems and I would do this as an avenue tree the whole way up the driveway I would maybe put in I would say on this side we could go with four and space them quite a generous 10 meters apart on the other side go with three and again, space them nice 10 metres apart. As a second choice then, I would go with Hornbeam. Hornbeam would be, you know, really stunning tree here as well. It really matched the property colour. It has a nice green leaf, very subtle green leaf. Um, it has nice sort of winter interest, as in it holds its leaf a bit like beech, but does it very gracefully. And then this would probably be my wild card, um, if I was to pick a tree for this, it would be Laburnum. That would be your tree with the big yellow flowers. You'd have to make sure you're buying really good quality laburnum. They are a wee bit more expensive as a smaller tree and I suppose their only seasonality of interest is just going to be those yellow flowers in spring where I feel the other two trees would give you far more seasonality later on in the year. That would just be why it's my wild card but as a wild card I still feel it would suit the property if the homeowner decided that they wanted to go with that. We're also going to consider hedging. Okay, so the only thing that my neighbours have onto this property is they've put in this lovely gravel. Um, I think this is golden quartz. Uh, just by quick glance, I'm not too sure actually. I haven't asked them what it is, but they've done a band here at the front. So this is at the road edge. And then they've done another trim off it here. And then again, as we've mentioned about the cobble sets, they have that continued over as the delineation or separation between the lawn. So where the lawn ends and where a new zone starts. So that's all really Really good so I think okay so we have this kind of nice gold with this nice gold and again we're, we're touching into the render details so some of the gravel here is picking up on those colors it's also picking up in the coping cap here as well there's just again a slight just of color but it's keeping in with that whole neutral theme then the gravel is going back to that sort of gold neutral theme and then we have our cobble so you know continuity is really strong here so style house again I'm going to bring it up again we've talked about the proportions here we've talked about how everything is equal proportions because of the style of house I think we have to go with a very traditional hedge I think for the style of this house for the lightness of the render and you're probably going to guess this what I'm going to say but a yew hedge would be stunning on here yew gives you that really lush dark emerald green um, foliage it's not a Leilandi hedge. Yew is much more classy than Leilandi. I think sometimes when people see you and if they're not too heavily into plants, they just straight off the bat think it's a conifer. But no, you would be a really classy dark emerald hedge in here. And because we have this just off position between the lower level here, as I've said, the house sits on a slightly higher level. So then we have the gravel and then we have the cobbled sets. The hedge might only be four foot, which doesn't sound a lot, because it means whilst you're sitting within the property, you could overlook the hedge. But if I was standing down here as a pedestrian and I'm walking past a four foot hedge, I can't see over it. So suddenly, you know, it's kind of like the French equivalent of a haha, -ha, which would have been an old idea in um, garden design, where they dug a slope away, meant they could sit in the house and they could look out, but all the agriculture animals couldn't come across. It's kind of the same idea. The hedge is short, on, as in it's not too tall on one side because it means when you're on this side you're being able to see over but as the pedestrian on this side looking up 
you can't see over. I think it would work really well here. Now, they could bring the hedge up to the same height as the pillar. That would be very cool as well. I think that would be really grand, and again, it would keep in with the proportions, but it maybe also means then, just when they're sitting in the house, if they're wanting to look out, they're maybe not seeing beyond the hedge, but I suppose that's a personal choice they can make themselves. It would be up to them. But, you know, I don't think you have to go with the tallest hedge in this case, because we have this luxury of the change of height and levels. Okay, so imagine we do go with the hedging option. So the two hedging options I would pick for this house would be the U hedge, that's my number one choice. I think that's gonna be so classy. Say for example, we go for the Avenue tree and we do go for the Bachelor Giacomonte or we go with the Laburnum. My second choice then would have been the Hornbeam tree. If, say for example, they don't want to go with the U hedge, I would then put in a Hornbeam hedge. And again, a Hornbeam would be a really classy hedge. You could do that same idea. Keep it four foot and be able to look over it from this height looking across, or just bring it up to the same height as the pillar. And I would start it at this far pillar over here in the distance and bring it right down and right around and we would finish it here. So then what would happen? We have roughly the 600 mil pillar, we have a bit of a gap and then the hedge, so say that's a meter wide, and then we have the, uh, the cobble trimming again. I think what would be really cool here, instead of just having avenue trees with a ring around them, make like big, one big wide strip bed. So it's coming up, it's, it's, a, it's actually mirroring the cobble. You're bringing it right up and right round and you could actually bring it right up to the top again, maybe with a gap somewhere, maybe closer here to the curve of the door. So then you have an entryway into the lawn. And, and I'm talking really generous because remember we have to match these proportions of the house. So I'm not talking some wee skimpy thing. That's where people get it so wrong. They put in these really minute, really thin borders and it absolutely drives me mad. Another thing that people do in garden design that drives me mad is they just push everything to the peripherals. You know, they push everything to the edge and they leave lawn in the middle. That is fine if you do it correctly. And funny enough, in this location that actually might work on this side of the lawn. The other side of the lawn would be slightly different, but if, if you were to do just a big wraparound bed, so remember the hedge would finish here, in my opinion, I think it would be nice to finish it here. The wraparound bed could actually come beyond it. So where I'm standing, so we're bringing it out maybe three meters and you're wrapping it right around. So then the border actually goes right across and touches the hedge. So then on this side, as well as the hedge and as your privacy, um, you're also having lots of soft planting in front of it. The hedge will act as a great shelter belt because as we are just slightly higher now, already I'm feeling that draft. I know that this house sits in a southwesterly position, so it's getting sun here all day. So there's no issue in natural daylight, which is fantastic for planting. Um, it really opens up your availability of what you could plant there. And then obviously with um, you know these utility zones, this is probably a space you wouldn't want to maybe plant trees too heavily near. Just, you know, again, you're allowing yourself 20, 30, 40 years down the line. No kind of um, issue with tree roots and stuff. Now, that's what I would say. People hear all these horror stories that you shouldn't plant a tree too close to this or tree roots have damaged this and blah, 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 blah. Trees are lazy. Like, if a tree wanted to break through something to get access to the other side, it would. But nine times out of 10, what I find is if you have concrete underground, a utilities box or something, and it's really enforced plastic or it's concrete, tree, the roots of the trees will run parallel with it. A tree has to really go out of its way to damage something. A tree does not want to have to break through something. That's a lot of effort. Like the tree has to be so pushed before it would break something under the ground, like your pipes, like your utilities. So you'll find the roots will run parallel with it until there was no other you know, option for it to go, then yes, okay, maybe it's gonna to have to break through something. But in a big open space like that, like I know underneath all the soil, the roots aren't competing with anything. So, you know, there's no reason why if you were to plant trees, maybe near here, I wouldn't be panicking too much. This is where you could incorporate your big island bed. So still keep the big wrap around hedge. I think that would look fantastic. Keep a really big generous wide border up the front here. Then this whole area here, I would love to do, you could have a colossal big circle or a big figure of eight would be quite cool. So two big circles, you could have a bigger circle on this side, then a slightly smaller circle here. And then this could all be hidden within soft planting, still accessible. So, you know, you could have big tall grasses. You could have things like miscanthus that would catch the wind really well, give you good up top null interest. You could have just really loose prairie uh, herbaceous planting 
all through this and then on top of those recess lids you could even set like a big pot so like you know like a big large terracotta pot or maybe a pot of a certain color maybe they want to do a color theme of pots you could just set them on top of those recess lids and then say you know worst case scenario if you ever had to come to this point in the future if you needed to get in here it's accessible Okay, so occasionally I've seen this in a few properties and it is uh, an electric pole. Now, there's not really too much you can do with this if this happens to be on your property. It is something that you have to roll with. It's not the end of the world, but you do need to be cautious of where you're planting your trees at and what you can maybe do if you wish to disguise it. What I would suggest is you can make like an informal wall with trellises. So you can put in four inch posts the whole way through, put your trellis in between, and then you can plant lots of climbers up it. And then that way you can just walk around the back. So if accessibility was ever needed, then somebody can just, you know, access the electric pole um, without it being too much of an issue. I would just build in front of it. And some people get really caught up about it. Like they really, you know, get really upset about it. I don't think it's the end of the world. You can still do lots of soft planting and under it like lots of tall herbaceous planting and under that would look absolutely fine and you know it wouldn't be the end of the world but what i would say is from an accessibility point of view if anybody ever did need to get to it that they can the front door is quite close here to the property to the lawn and something else you know they might want to consider you could have a patio um, maybe more so on this upper level and again hide it all in round with planting so wrap around planting so you could have a hedge here but you could have an additional hedge around like a small patio you could have I don't know table and chairs maybe set up to eight people um, somewhere here quite close to your door because that's your access point now the other doors in this property are all on the other side so it probably will have to be positioned closer to the door but I would keep that you could keep that quite central into the lawn you could even you know if you wanted to go really far you could actually bunker it you could excavate a lot of earth here and step down into it so it was a hidden uh, patio um, now there'd be quite a lot of excavation work to do that and that would be at a higher cost but it would be something that would be quite cool okay so lastly i feel that we haven't really discussed the side of the garden so much this is the side that's slightly smaller from the other side but again proportionally is still quite a good sizable area so as we mentioned previously about doing quite a long wide strip border um, the whole way up you'd have to mirror both sides compatibly keeps that continuity so let's say hypothetically we go back to the idea of the white bachelor jack monte tree i think that would look really cool the whole way up this but if we're going to do a three or four meter wide border what else what else is in that so we need to have some evergreen interest and this is where i feel i'm going back to that idea of the three topiary style spheres but i think this would look really cool where you have like an ilex crenata sphere um, a taxis baccata sphere which would be the u-ball and the box of sempiverum sphere and have them all trioed in different sizes also what would look really cool in through this would be pinus mugu Again, these are all really low maintenance plants. They're not going to require much work. They're all plants that can take a wee bit of abuse. They'll do really well in the soil. They'll cope really well in full sun. They'll cope really well with the wind because this location is quite prone to wind, like myself. Um, and that gives you your evergreen structure. So that takes you through your winter months. That's taking you through from November right through to, let's say, March, April time. So then what else do we have? We need to have some colour in here. So I also feel in between the Betula Jack Monte eyes, you could have Hydrangea paniculata limelight. So that's going to cover you also for some winter interest, but it's also your late summer and autumn interest. So that's going to give you those lovely white conical flowers. It's going to sit as a nice medium shrub. Um, in the winter, it goes into that sort of um, dead golden phase where you have these like lovely gold seed heads. That's going to look really sharp with your frost. And then remember, you're going to have all your shades of green. You're going to have maybe the two shade of uh, needle color on the Pinus mugu. You're going to have those hydrangea paniculatas with the white uh, flowers. So that's covering you for all your autumnally stuff. What else could we incorporate in here? We could do dwarf azaleas and actually maybe keep it into that white theme. Now we could do like a pastel pink uh, if the homeowner wanted to, but I think it'd be quite cool to keep it in white again, just tying in with this render colour. Um, that would be quite classy. That would tie in with your hydrangeas later on the season. And they're going to be quite low growing and have like a really shiny evergreen leaf. Um, we could have the occasional clump of miscanthus and that's going to be like quite a tall deciduous grass. So it's going to again give you some winter interest because it'll go all gold. But in like late summer, autumn, you're going to have that rustle. You're going to have all that movement of the foliage. So again, that's going to catch the draft really well. We could underbed all of this 
in mulch, but we could continue with the gravel color that we've seen previously. So that lovely golden gravel, that could be a mulch the whole way up this. So again, you're keeping that continuity all the same. You're bringing it from the road and you're bringing it right up through. So even if the plants are out of season, you have just that really nice clean gravel base at the bottom. Um, occasionally, you know, there might be the odd wee bit of leaf litter, but again, you know, nothing that a leaf blower wouldn't take out. A lot of those plants I was mentioning there are evergreens as well. So, you know, they're not going to drop too much leaf litter. That's reducing your maintenance straight away. Then for flowering colours then, like what else could we have? So we could incorporate bulbs into this. We could have purple allium sensation. Allium sensation would take you through then from late May into June and you could have them all darted through. Then again, you've got that spherical shape off the allium. You have your topiary shape and then all of those spherigals are all picking up together. Even if the allium dries off, then you're still going to have that gold head in the autumn. That would carry the whole way up through here. These are just ideas that I'm knocking out of my head very quickly here, but we still have quite a bit of empty space here to fill. You could do quite an informal forest if the homeowner wanted to. This is maybe where you could incorporate a different type of tree. So say we went that bitch La Jagmontia here on the avenue, we could incorporate this into maybe horn beams and we could do like a really staggered effect. Now there is a gate here in the bottom corner that the homeowner might need access to so we would maybe have to stop here but that could be a really cool feature. You could underplant that then with lots of hostas and ferns and maybe throw in a couple of logs and do like a whole woodlandy thing in there. Um, I think that would be really cool. And it sits far enough away that it wouldn't take away from anything else. I mentioned earlier about like a big circle lawn over there. You could even duplicate it here. You'd have like a big circle lawn here and do really tall planting. Again, you could even have like a big miscanthus hedge, a big tall grass hedge coming around in a big sphere. That would all rustle and you'd have this complete hidden lawnway out of the way out of view you could put sun loungers and stuff here you could do something completely different you could do like another maybe hedge you could do like another u curve even like just a semi circle and then have this big circle lawn and then maybe do lower planting around it and then a lawn path right out to the edge and then that would tie up to the front door and then as we mentioned on the other side say maybe they've done a patio so as they're coming out the door they have the two entry points both equal so you can go left or right so you're coming out of the door you can go left we can go over here we can at the patio we could go right and we could have a lawn area done like a patio it would be completely secluded and nobody would see it um, if you do live in a rural location and you're thinking of a garden design my top tip would be don't plant your trees randomly if you are buying trees, please stick with continuity. Try and stick with one type of tree because that keeps the continuity so much more. If your house has good proportions, do not scrimp on little tiny, tiny borders. Have big generous borders, match like for like. You need to keep that balance the same because the worst thing you can do is come to a house and be like, oh, they've put all this effort into an architect spacing out all these rooms and then they scrimped on their landscaping. And the first thing the person sees when they arrive at your house is outside, not inside. Take into consideration your render colour. Take into consideration where your doors are. If you've done your doorstep before your patio, then always remember that when you are linking your patio in, if it is going to be close proximity to your door, that you kind of link all the materials the same. Again, it's just good for continuity. If you do have things like the recess lids, then think about them first. Don't see them as a problem. Think about what you could do in that space and then plan everything else around that. If you have any questions about this video or you want to ask any questions, please drop me a message below. Um, I will gladly answer them as best I can. And as always, thank you for watching and thank you for supporting this channel. Bye.